In this part I would like to demonstrate how the measurement looks like. So it's, uh, of course, I'll try to measure a couple of muscles, not only one. On the first one it will take a little bit longer. I would like, you know, to explain each step that I'm doing. So it will take, you know, a few minutes for the muscle to, to be measured. But um, when you are doing it, you know, when you're skilled enough, um, to, to use the tool, then usually you shouldn't take more than one minute per muscle to, to measure. So that means that uh, in most cases, uh, like I said, if you're measuring 20 muscles, that would require somewhere around 20 minutes to, to get the measurement done. Um, of course, in the beginning it takes a little bit longer. It depends on, you know, just, you know, the skill that you need to to, to learn, uh, you know, how to, to understand how, you know, the whole system moves. Um, and as, as soon as you do that, it's quite quick. Sometimes when we are, um, you know, offering services, especially if you're doing it for a team or a national team, uh, when they do multiple, multiple, um, you know, performance tests at the same time and also, um, uh, you know, usually they give some, you know, they take blood samples and so on. So what I wanted to say is you have a team of 25 or even more people and they're doing many different things on the same day. You have to be quick to get the measurements done. So in that case, we usually team up. So there are two people using the device. One is on the computer, the other one is on, on the subject. So in most cases, if everything is okay, if you don't have to put the data, <coughs> so the data of the new subject in the, in the computer, um, if you already measure that person, uh, it takes us about 15 minutes per 20 muscles, so 15 minutes per, per subject. So that means that um, sometimes we even use two systems at the same time. Uh, you know, with two systems, four people, you, you are able to do the whole team within two or three hours. So it can be quite quick, but in the beginning, um, you know, of course it takes a little bit longer time, especially if you, you know, each measurement you, you do, if you're trying to understand the curve, if you're looking at the parameters, that takes some time. So in the beginning it will take you probably 45 minutes to do 20 muscles. Uh, within, you know, five or six subjects that you will measure, this time will be reduced by half. So, but again, I'll start slow on the first muscle and then I will try to, to make it a little bit faster on the second one so you can see how the thing actually uh, is used when you are measuring, let's say, live. So, first off, the position of the subject. So like I said, these support pads are used to ensure, you know, 30 degrees flexion in the knee. Um, this support pad, in this case, I don't know if you can see it or not, it's, it's not symmetric, uh, so the short side usually goes towards the hip and the long one go, goes towards the ankle. What you want to achieve is you want to get the whole leg to be supported by the support pad. So um, you don't want to see a position like that. It wouldn't affect the results much, but nevertheless, you try to, to make the subject um, in the position in which the muscles that you're measuring are really, really relaxed. Um, so the second thing that you need to do, you need to position the electrodes over the muscle belly that you will measure. So in this case, uh, you know what you'll do, so you will see a little bit more. we we'll just switch yeah. the legs, okay? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So we'll measure the medial head because you will see it probably from the last row, um, you know, where the muscle belly borders are so you will understand where you should position the electrodes before the measurement. So in this case we will start with the medial head, so the vastus medialis muscle. I know where it is, but in order for me to, to position the electrodes easier, I usually, usually ask a subject to contract. Probably you can see from there, this is, these are the borders of the muscle belly. You can relax. So if I want to isolate as much as I can, and I want, I would like to put both electrodes within 
you know, dead, uh, dead muscle belly. If I go across, if I go too high with one electrode, I will get direct co-contraction from the rectus femoris muscle, which will affect the result that I get. So, maybe not the first part, but especially the second one. But again, criteria should be try to isolate as much as you can. So again, please extend your knee. I will measure in the center of the muscle belly. Relax. So I put one electrode higher and one electrode lower. So one proximal, the other one distal from the measuring point. In this case, um, the space between the electrodes is few centimeters. So it, it all depends on how big the muscle is. Sometimes, uh, since these are not the only electrodes that you have to use, in most cases, this uh, standard size 50 by 50 millimeters is used. And for most of the big muscles, it's good enough. So you need to leave enough room for the, for the sensor to be positioned um, but if you have a long muscle, like, I don't know, it's erectus femoris, you usually leave up to one width of the electrode. So it's five centimeters, then you have five centimeters space, and again, five centimeters is the other electrode. Um, so this is about placement. The orientation of the electrodes will not affect the result, but some, uh, you know, if you read the research papers, they try to use the same positioning. So one electrode, so positive, always proximal, negative, distal, or even vice versa. It depends on what do you choose. Again, it will not affect the results, but if you want to have the same protocol, then you follow the same procedure. Um, next step would be positioning of the sensor. Before I position the <coughs> sensor, I will just make some comments about how the position, how the sensor should be positioned. So you just bring everything closer. The criteria that you have to follow is, um, so the amplitude of the sensor tip is 32 millimeters. I don't know if you remember the numbers, the displacement, the DM was somewhere between two and 15 millimeters. Um, in that case, that means that you shouldn't press more than half the sensor tip in when you're positioning on the muscle. So you need to leave enough room for the sensor tip to measure, uh, to move. So during the measurement, you will clearly see if you pushed it too far in, you will get you know, a flat line on top. That means that the sensor went all the way in and you have no additional movement. On the other hand, you need to, to create some pressure on the muscle that you are measuring. So you don't just lean against the muscle, you have to press, so the sensor tip should move a little bit inside the sensor, because that means that you have the um, contact with the muscle that you will be measuring. If you don't have this contact, this initial pressure, you will not record the beginning of contraction. So criteria should be press the sensor tip in and leave enough room for the sensor tip to move. So in most cases, push it about halfway in, and that should, that should do it. Now, where exactly do you position the sensor? Like I said, each muscle has a certain guidelines, but in this case, it's quite straightforward. I will put it in the center of the muscle belly, in this case, like in this area, relax, and I will put it perpendicular to the surface of the skin, or on, uh, perpendicular to the muscle because when the muscle will contract it will um, generate movement in that direction so I would like to position the sensor in the direction in which the, the muscle belly will um, deform in this case this is quite simple some muscles are a little bit different but again uh, some guidelines uh, are given every time that um, a new person is taught how to use the TMG so, let's do that. Once you position the sensor, then you ask a subject not to move again, because now if, you know, there is a small movement, it doesn't uh, affect everything, but if you would have a big movement now, so the sensor would, you know, go to a completely different position, obviously that would 
affect the result that you will get. So, when you position, once you position this, you are ready to begin with the measurement. So, um, I just put one random, uh, random uh, subject inside, so I didn't take his his uh, real data. So, now the results that will be shown will be. Just let me skip back to see it. A subject who is between 22, uh, between 20 and 29, and the spore that I've chose chose it's all slash none. That means it will be just an average of of all sports. So if I would measure a soccer player, I would say, okay, what's your age? Because the age will affect the reference values that will be shown. Of course, the gender will affect the reference values that will be shown, and the position in which this soccer player is playing will affect the reference values. So you try to make um, <coughs> the right choice when cho choosing uh, the sport in which the subject is involved in. Otherwise, you know, if you put the sprinter data as reference values, he would be, he would seem to be very, very slow, and all the muscles would seem very, very loose. But if uh, you know, if you compare it to the to the data it should be compared to the results would probably look quite normal. Um, so, so maybe so just how many how how many people have you in the database? Um, <coughs> it depends on sports. So for some sports, for like soccer, we have thousands. For basketball, we have hundreds. For swimming, that would also be something that Louis is interested in. We have maybe twenty or thirty people. So, but. Uh, Again, you know, the software allows you to generate your own reference database within 30 seconds, as soon as you have enough subjects to, to measure. Um, so, when you choose which muscle to measure here, you can choose it just by clicking on these dots here. Uh, here beneath you have, you know, some reminder of where the electrodes should be and where the sensor should be. In this case, we have right vastus medialis muscle and when I choose this, I'm ready to do the measurement. So just before I click on the measure, um, I will explain what you will see. You will get, obviously, you will get a curve. The curve will be in orange. That means that th th that is a current measurement. So this is the measurement I just did. When I will do more measurements than one, all the previous ones will be shown in blue color. So you will see how the, the signal is gradually getting higher and higher. If I move to the other side, I would have the green curve also for comparison between left and right. If I did the measurement on this person, on this, this muscle somewhere in the past, I can also see um, the black curve that will show me I will also get the black curve that will show me the measurements from either the you know the previous one up to six previous measurements so I can during the measurement I can compare left and right I can compare today's measurement to last month's measurement if I want to of course not the numbers if you want to see the numbers then you generate the trend report it's just for the you know the first impression you know if there is any difference or not um, okay so let's start the protocol again this is just the guideline you know you do whatever you want actually but um, we usually start at around 20 milliampers so the stimulator can go up to 100 milliampers the average value where you get um, the maximum display uh, so the maximum contraction it, it depends on a few factors but it is around 60 70 milliampers uh, but sometimes it can be even 20 so it depends on you know the type of skin if the skin is dry you will need a little bit more current excuse me um, if you have a, a little bit more fat tissue you will need a little bit more current if you <coughs> have the electrodes which are dry um, you will need a little bit more current so because you never know uh, how much you start low let's say around 20 usually if you start with 10 you will get flat line so you're beneath the threshold um, so again we start at 20 and then we gradually increase usually by steps of 10 milliampers 
until we get maximum response or until we get the supra maximum stimulation. So that means that I will increase until I get two responses which are exactly the same even if I increased the current. So let's try it. We'll start with around 20. Let's go. So I don't know if you saw the, the muscle movement. <coughs> so this is you know, the response that we got. Now to look at these numbers wouldn't make any sense because obviously you know you can see the contraction time now is 60% slower than the average because we are just we just stimulated you know one small small part of of the muscle so what we'll do is we'll go to around 30 measure again so this was the previous one this is the last one that I did so I could I continue the same protocol until I get two responses which are exactly the same. So for that reason, so the default number of previous measurements is one. Now we have six, why? To just to demonstrate how the signal is increasing. So first, second, third, fourth, but I prefer to use just one previous just to see if there is any difference between previous one and this one. <coughs> measure again still some difference here so what you want to get you want to have the complete overlap up until here if there is some difference later on we are not so much concerned but the first part of the curve should be completely the same so still a little bit of a difference not a big one so probably we'll need one more Yeah, and that's it. So we went from 70 to 80 milliampers now and we got completely overlap of the two curves. So even if I would continue, I would get the same response. Sometimes um, it's even, it's, you have to be a little bit more careful. Here it's not a big problem because you don't have deep muscles that will interfere too much. But if I would measure the strocnemius muscle, which is thin, and if I see that the first part, you know, the first peak, the, the gastrocnemius muscle is the same, and if I continue to increase current, the second peak will continue to increase. That's the solus co-contraction that is, you know, increasing more and more. I don't need that. So I can stop when the first peak stops increasing. So that's it. What we get here, we had seven measurements. The last one is on top. This is the, the one that I'm interested in. So I will click Save Last. Everything else will be deleted. I will be left with the last measurement here. So what do I get as a feedback? In this case, it says, OK, the muscle is 4% faster than the average value. So his value is 24.6. The average is 25.7 or 8. And displacement is just about normal, normal, let's say optimal. So it's just 4% different than the average. So what we have here, we have a lot of green color, especially the first one and the last one. So I would consider this quite a nice response. So that's one muscle, the protocol for measuring one, one particular muscle. I will now move to the second one and uh, I will try to make it a little bit faster like we usually do it. So no explanation in between. I'll go to the rectus femoris. So, again, <coughs> you ask a subject to contract the muscle. Okay, you locate the muscle belly, relax. Put the sensor on. and measure. So, in most cases, like I said, you go by these 10 milliampere steps. In, I usually don't look too much at the numbers. I just go, you know, approximately 10 milliampers higher. So, I will explain this kicking motion a little bit later. I just like to go through the measurement protocol. Uh, 
Okay, so that's how fast usually it goes. So it, probably it was about a minute from the moment of positioning to the end of the measurement protocol. So again, a little bit faster than the average, another 4%, they're quite stable. Um, and the displacement is also quite okay. So about the kicking motion, the kicking motion that occurs um, during measurement of the rectus femoris, it, will, it doesn't affect the results at all. You can see these waves here later on. So you shouldn't prevent it because sometimes if you try to prevent it, um, because the leg cannot move in this direction, the whole leg will dip down a little bit. So you will change the angle in the knee joint and the, the, the whole leg can actually move away from the sensor. So you shouldn't force a subject to stay in the position. As, like I said, it will not influence the results at all. Because I heard somebody, you know, laughing a little bit when there was this kicking motion going on. So that's it. This is the rectus femoris. I will go now to the lateral head and I will turn him around and also measure the, 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 the biceps femoris just so we have one functional symmetry that, you know, we can at least look at something when we will um, generate the report when we finish. Okay, can you extend again? Relax. So, in this case, this muscle is just slightly slower, like you see, 5%. And displacement, so the last column, is a little bit higher than reference values. So this muscle is a little bit more loose than the average values. Um, okay, can you turn around with this? I will use this. Lift your legs a little bit. Okay. Okay, bend your knee, push into my hand. Relax. How's your hamstring workout? Cycle. Okay. I did do some yesterday. So. <laughs> okay, we'll see. There are so Okay, this one again, it's okay, more or less about average, but it is a little bit stiffer than the average. So, like I said, usually, of course, you measure more muscle if you want to make a muscle profile. Why would you, for example, do a measurement like this if you would have some sort of issues either with hamstrings or with, with your knee? or also with the quadriceps muscle. Of course, I would measure left and right to also see you know, if, if one side is injured to have a reference value, so the healthy side. So in order not to, you know, to take too much time, 
we will just stick with this side so when you finish you just generate the report immediately so we'll, we will not have a lot of data here but we will at least have something so we have two functional symmetries in this case we have the symmetry for patellar ligament we compare the medial and lateral head of quadriceps the symmetry is 90 percent which is okay which is actually quite good and we have the symmetry between quadriceps and the biceps femoris muscle the symmetry is just right on the edge of you know uh, acceptable because the thing is uh, he has a quite fast hamstring especially not hamstring sorry quadriceps especially the the muscles around the knee here so the medial and lateral one um, the rectus also according to the reference values is slightly faster as you will see later on this biceps femoris is just slightly slightly slower so when we go down this looks quite empty because you know we have no lateral symmetries and only a couple of functional ones when comparing the speed of contraction you can see that you know all four muscles so okay I would say they're, they're all quite none of them is really slow um, what you would like to see you would like to see everything in green you see the lateral head and the biceps femoris are just slightly over and we are talking about one or two or three percent so still okay and for the tonus here we have one stiff muscle and one loose muscles we have two which are more or less just right on the average so what would that mean that as a recommendation at the end you would have for the muscles which is too loose you would have strength exercises in order to tone up and for the muscle which is <coughs> too stiff uh, stretch or relaxation treatment or exercise to release or to reduce the tonus in that particular muscle of course you also have the text in order to support that and that's it like I said that's uh, just a limited number of muscles so that's why this kind of report looks a little bit you know short but uh, in most cases when you measure 20 muscles you saw the full report and you see that uh, the data that you get is even more um, useful so for example if I would do the same the same four muscles on the other leg I would also have the lateral symmetries calculations so you could also have some additional um, recommendations based on that because right now you know what would be interesting to see if the same two muscles are also you know uh, too loose or too stiff on the other leg uh, because then you can find out why you know why these properties are not within the range that you would supposed to so he said that he did some hamstring exercise yesterday usually the thing is um, that shouldn't be a factor you know if you have a you know, increased tonus uh, it shouldn't be because just of the last exercise of course if you do it immediately after an exercise that will that will affect the results but uh, if you measure you know one day after what is considered a normal training program or a training session it's usually uh, you know a property that is there for a long time so he has these muscles probably hypertoned for a long longer period of time not because of the yesterday's exercise um, why I'm telling you this because sometimes uh, you know uh, if you working with athletes you cannot always determine you know that you will do the the testing you know first thing in the morning when you have no effect on the muscle function at all uh, of course these are the perfect circumstances but in most cases we did the measurements you know after the training but if you wait about 30 minutes after the training the effect on the results will be gone so you can easily do the measurements and consider those results valid if you would do the measurements immediately after the training probably some of the properties would change 
So this is just where to position uh, this, this measurement in. But if this is your intention, then of course you would measure immediately after the training. So this is how the measurement looks like. Again, you don't have to use this uh, report. In most cases, the researchers, they just take uh, the raw data, which is generated the same way. And what you get, you get for each muscle, you get a separate column. So you have all five parameters here. You also have this amplitude is the amplitude of stimulation. So you have how many milliampers was used on the, the last measurement. And then you have 1000 rows for each millisecond. So I didn't explain that before. So we are monitoring for one second what's going on. So that's 1000 milliseconds. In most cases, everything is over at three, 350 milliseconds. But sometimes it's not, you know, especially with the lower back, lower back issues, it can take 700, 800 milliseconds for the muscle to relax. So this is, you know, something that can be also used, um, you know, for analyzing the data. You can also have a choice to export everything in TXT, so you can import it in some other softwares that you use for uh, statistical analysis and, you know, all results are immediately available. From your experience in practice though, you probably don't do somebody's whole body. Like if you're working yeah. with a football team, uh, you probably know they have a hamstring injury. So you probably just do the two legs. Is that yeah. right? Yeah. So after an injury, after an injury you focus on the problem area, but um, when monitoring, that's, it makes sense, you know, if you want to see how the biceps femoris uh, recovers after an injury, you will focus on that muscle. But uh, what I would suggest is immediately after an injury, you also measure the muscles around because sometimes, you know, the problem why the injury actually occurred is because there is a symmetry with some other muscles. For example, you know, you have fast quadriceps, you have slow hamstrings. So if you measure the quadriceps also, it can give you, you know, some answers about why the injury actually occurred. So, or you go, you know, at least, you know, one joint up or down, because sometimes you can have a problem not in the area that was actually injured, so the cause is somewhere else, and maybe you can use the TMG to determine that. So I would say that for the first measurement after an injury, a little bit more than one muscle group. So if we're talking about hamstrings, at least I would also do the quads. So four pairs, eight muscles. Um, but when you when you monitor, you just go left and right, hamstring, and, and that's it. Uh, Someone uh, asked um, a question about what are the things that cause errors with the system. And someone had brought up the idea of someone has a lot of fat. Yeah. It, could you yeah, so if, uh, you know, the thing is, if you have the fat in reasonable amounts, it will not affect the measurement at all. So the thing is, um, if you're talking about the response of the muscle, uh, when you press this sensor tip against the, the muscle or the skin, the fat tissue will also be compressed, and when the muscle moves, this distance will not change. So you will actually monitor the response of the muscle. But if you have a, you know, really a, you know, a lot of fat, especially when you're measuring, you know, even if you have a lot of fat on the legs, you still get you know, the results that are normal. But it would be a difficult, if you would measure your obese person, you would try to measure lower back muscles. And if you have, let's say 10 centimeters of fat, then you have two problems. You know, the, the, the electrical field will just stimulate everything, not just, you know, the isolated muscle that you want. So the whole area will, you know, all the other muscles in, in, in the core 
will contract and you will not get you know this outward movement of the muscle belly you will just get you know you will see that something is contracting but you will get almost no response even sometimes you will get a negative curve that would be that would be the, in the case in which the fat is the factor that will prevent you from getting the result. Is that theory or is that something you've experienced? I've experienced. And does that fat cause an issue for the electrode stimulation as well? What do so, you so for example if you're trying to stimulate muscle <laughs> and you have a lot of fat yeah. then you have to turn up the stimulus. Yes, sure. But does that cause problems as well? No, no, no because it's you know the thing is it's, it's all about how much current so how much electrical field actually you know reaches the muscle so if, if you have a current which is too low you will not even get to, to the muscle and nothing will happen and you know no discomfort will be caused about that so it's, uh, it's all about you know, how deep the electrical field will penetrate on the other hand like I said if you use too much for thin muscles like a strenuous lateralis then you have to be careful not to overdo it on the other side, not because it would be uh, unpleasant for the subject, but you will stimulate more muscles that you want to, and it can, you know, somehow affect the the, the data that you're uh, getting. So, this this is just a factor that you have to, you know, take into consideration when when measuring. I don't know if anyone else had thought about it, but I did, and that was what. What was the accuracy of the linear displacement change to you? So I know the answer to this, but I just wanted uh, people to understand that this isn't just a run-of-the-mill uh, linear displacement transducer. Um, I think you were saying that it measures down to microns or... So one thing? micrometer is the accuracy. Um, yeah, and the, <clears throat> the, you know, so this is the accuracy of this, you know, the sensor tip or the steam, uh, sensor, and uh, also if you look at the results here, you can see that they're written in, you know, yeah, these are the milliseconds with, you know, two, two decimals. So it's uh, probably too precise. So, but the thing is, you know, you have the tool that can, it is very precise, you know, how much uh, you want to go into details, you know, it's up to you, but uh, yeah, it can, it can monitor every slight change in, in the muscle function. So from that point of view, I think it's yeah, quite useful. I think that uh, I think there are a couple of papers. I'm not sure that. So the thing, if you are within the reasonable, uh, if you are within the reasonable area, so if you're not measuring, you know, like sub-zero temperatures. And if it's not, you know, about 50 degrees, then I'm talking Celsius, then you should get more or less stable results. Of course, if you, uh, you know, not only the outside temperature, if you take, you know, some ice and put it on the muscle and measure again, or if you go to have the cryotherapy, that will affect the properties uh, for sure. Um, so yes, it can detect that. But, uh, you know, to be concerned that you have to always measure in very stable laboratory conditions you don't have to worry about that so within you know so if you feel comfortable wearing shorts then you know the results would be more or less very very stable are there any restrictions on what people can consume in the diet before the testing for example caffeine yeah again it's uh I don't think it was published, but uh, I know that you know some researchers they try to see the effect. If you have a, you know a lot of caffeine, it will affect a little bit, not much, so not not significantly, but it can change a little bit. So the muscles react to that, and also they react to to alcohol consumption. So yes, 
it can detect it, but you, you wouldn't see um, very significant change. But the trend is there. Yeah. So the bottom line is, if you have something that will affect the muscle function, you have the tool which is selective enough and precise enough to pick it up. Um, you know, and then it's all up to you to you know, in your imagination to see you know because also, not only what you do to the muscles but what a certain you know condition can do to the muscles because uh, you know you have publications about uh, how a, you know Parkinson's disease will affect uh, spastic muscles how they react to the measurement. Uh, um, Alzheimer's disease, multiple sclerosis, so you know everything that will affect the muscle function can be evaluated with the TNG because like I said it, it is precise enough as you probably now understand. Anything else? Okay, so that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much.